joining us today on Around the Peninsula. I'm Maria Sorreo. On today's show, we will take you on an educational journey on what it's like to have a child with special needs and what it takes for them to transition into adulthood. California uh recognizes a population of just about 300,000 individuals that were born with and living with developmental disabilities. Developmental disabilities are, are uh, disabling conditions that are either, either present at birth or uh, appear uh, during childhood and are disabilities that there really are no cures for or complete uh, 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 transitions out of. They're lifelong disabilities um, with uh, good services and supports, counseling and support for families, education and training, uh, and community development work. Uh, regardless of how severe a person's disability is, we found that people can go on to live wonderful, rich, meaningful lives, valued by their community, productive in many aspects of community life. And so that's really what this is all about, is trying to help people live the lives they're capable of and helping communities benefit from the gifts that all citizens have, regardless of disability. I know that you mentioned just in LA County, some of the numbers are pretty eye-opening. Yeah. Uh, within the county, we've identified a little bit more than 90,000 individuals, that's children and adults, uh, living with developmental disabilities. But it's important to know that, that a, a, a developmental disability uh, isn't a condition that only affects the individual. Mm -hmm. Think about uh, family members, right. think about parents, mm -hmm. um, who in many cases devote their lives to making sure that their disabled child has every opportunity and every, and every uh, type of care and support that can help that person grow and thrive. Mm -hmm. And the challenges that, that families face along the way in parenting and helping a disabled child to, to live a good life uh, often uh, uh, take the family, the entire family, on a journey that they never expected. One of those families are Jim and Kathy Gott. Jim Gott was a successful Major League Baseball player, while wife Kathy raised two sons diagnosed with autism. But it was the whole family who faced the challenges ahead. For me as a ball player, you know, we have those family games every year, and everybody's bringing their group out there. Manny Moda's group was much bigger than everybody else's, but, you know, whether you had eight kids or one kid, you know, everybody was proud to have their kids out there, and you're always seeing the Van Slykes and the Barras of the world where their kids are on their way to the big leagues, even when they're one and two, they've got great swings. And uh, with my first son, CJ, uh, it just wasn't that. And then Danny came along a few years later, and... Uh, Experiencing this with Kathy was much different from my first experience. The first experience was, wow, it just it wasn't working. Whereas now working with a spouse that understands this and has taken the lead over the last 24 years, 23 years with Danny, I've been able to see how it works. And uh, the way that Kathy has developed businesses around this, the way that she is advocating for this, now she's a, a county commissioner. I mean, it's unbelievable to see um, a mom uh, being very proactive, doing everything that she could to make not only our child's life better, but those around. And it's become a big cause in our home, and we are very passionate about it. And I'm just, again, I'm very proud of what Kathy's done, but all the nuts and bolts are Kathy. You, know, you should be proud of her and, and proud of Danny. Uh, he's out on his own. He works. Was that a difficult transition for mom and dad? Yes. <laughs> well, I do want to explain because there it touches so many issues when we talk about our own experience. But it was it was obviously uh, a really difficult time going through the diagnostics. Um, as Jim mentioned earlier, his first son was diagnosed with autism when he was living with us, um, and so going through that uh, was. Well, it would be a lot easier today because there's so many more people identified. When CJ and Danny were both diagnosed in the early 90s, there it was, you know, one, it went from one in 10,000 kids with autism to one in 5,000 kids in the early 90s. And, you know, go, coming from a rare uh, disorder, which was thought to be not just in our generation, in our lifetime, it was thought to be a psychological disorder caused by the mother. 
and it was um, the mothers were called refrigerator moms. So I can only like I try to look at how we've progressed because I think about that and how awful and the guilt and all the uh, grieving and emotions that come when something's not develop you know your right. child isn't developing typically and then to have at least by the time our kids were diagnosed it was understood that you know it's a neurobiological issue it's not some psychological condition it also seems like there was just not enough knowledge when it came to being able to identify kids that you know like we, we talked once about in school kids that were a little slower the kids that got in trouble they didn't even know what it was back then right well there is clearly better diagnoses and tools and however none of that can account for the growth in the numbers so I was talking about the early 90s let's fast forward to today it's one in 68 children are diagnosed with autism in the in in the United States and that's not even everyone who's been identified that is who's been identified and it's more prevalent in boys so it's one in 46 boys are born today with autism. But what's happened is that the generation of the early 90s, when, as Steve mentioned earlier, we're talking about shifting from kind of this institutional, there was no inclusion, there was no inclusive school, nothing. It was right. just those kids were shipped off. Yep. So thank goodness we grew up with the emergence of inclusion. But but what's what needs to catch up now is that the numbers of kids who are turning 18 or 22 when they exit the school system and enter the realm of adult services, we are way behind the mark. We are not prepared. There's not enough funding. There's not enough programs. There's not enough people because those large numbers of kids, that first tsunami, the wave of the, the surge in diagnosis um, is now entering adulthood and it's already such a tax system. So it's, uh, it's, it just, I, I don't know, it's just in this time in my life now that the nuts and bolts are in place with all of our children and we're empty nesters. And uh, while I enjoy uh, traveling all over with Jim, we have a great, great life. I, um, I've devoted this part of my life to a more macro level of change and trying to educate people and, um, you know, get them to really understand and understand us as a family and, and be more compassionate, more accepting, more loving, more inclusive. And it's just been a real joy. I, I know that families have come to you, ask you questions. What's it like? What can I do? All those kind of things. What is their biggest challenge, do you think? Well, the now, maybe it's just because we all grew up, our kids all grew up together. The challenge is once they exit the school system, because you have to remember with a family like such as ours, the moment you enter special education, you have sort of a team around you with special education teachers and therapists and specialists. And, and it's, it's wonderful. And I mean, I, it takes a village, you know, I could never have done this alone. And there's numerous people in our tribe to, that have, you know, helped us get this far. But, um, once you exit that system, you enter into the adult realm, and it's a whole new language, it's a whole new set of services, it's different funding streams, it's, it's so complex, and, and it's so unique for every child. So something that um, I created within the last two years at a wonderful, wonderful organization called ETTA, E-T-T-A, uh, is a program called Transitions, and it's to guide families through the process more smoothly. There's so many people that don't understand, for example, that if a child with developmental disabilities or a young adult or adult of any age is working, they're not going to lose their social security. They're going to get more money. And it's just, there's so much education and missing, it's, people are really misinformed and not aware of all the wonderful programs and services that are available, that our kids can have this, this wonderful circle of supports around them. So that has been, those are most of the phone calls I get today. So Dan Danny lives in his own house. How'd you make that happen? So, how what are there openings for work at Danny's farm? And where else can? Well, how can I create a, a, a job environment for our son who loves music or um, patterns or art or you know whatever whatever it is? There's just so it's uh, it's it's a it's a joy to give back because I I have to say this out loud. 
there were, I mean, this, there's a couple that I just have to mention their names. It's um, Harvey and Connie Lapin. And the Lapins, um, their son with severe autism is about my age. So they were the families that were co-authoring the Lanterman Act. And I mean, it gives me chills because I think of what they did for us. And they introduced me to adult services and what, what Danny could have and be entitled to. And I, I feel as though it's my turn to carry that torch. I really, it makes me want to cry when I think about how many angels were there on my shoulder and how I just want to be there for the up and coming families to make it better and better and progress as, as a community. You know, the one thing I'd like to just share is just, I think I think that acceptance at the beginning was the most important thing, and I fought it for a long time. I, I wanted there to be a silver bullet. I wanted there to be a pill or a therapy or something that was going to take this all away. And it wasn't until I was accepting of this that this is my son, CJ and Danny, that have autism, both different degrees of autism. And then once I accepted that and grieved whatever I needed to grieve and go through that emotion and then accepted them and their lives and what they could bring, just as Kathy was just saying, just that it's been such a joy and the people that we've been able to come across and the, the, the goodness of others, all of that is unbelievable. And we're just grateful to be able to have these kids. And then after that acceptance happens, I think the education process is just a, can be a tsunami also. That can be a, a big wave of things. And I think just take it, take it slowly for parents to understand that there's other parents, like we're talking about the Lapins that are out there that have experienced this already. And I wanted to find out, as Kathy did too, from other families that have experienced this and is there a, you know, who, it's funny how uh, in those waiting rooms of a speech therapist or a doctor or whatever therapy our kids are going through, that's where all the learning is happening. When, when you go and you're sitting there and, you know, instead of reading People magazine, just the talking that's going on there and the sharing and the, it's unbelievable. And we just, we really love and are grateful to be part of this community. I will tell you this, as hard as it is and as hard as it was to let him go, I knew in my heart it was best for Danny. Right. to I baby him. I mother him. That's my job. Right. When my neurotypical son comes home, I am I baby him too. I mean, it's just what a mom does. Right. And it's my privilege. I get to do that because they're my babies and always will be. But that's not in Danny's best interest. And I really try to encourage parents to let go as much as they can and allow our kids to spread their wings and shine and contribute to this to our society Danny's a big member of our community and right. he touches a lot of people and it's because he's out there i currently live in altadena on my own i'm on my own with with a few roommates okay um there's one named Perla. She's more of a big sister figure. And then there's Lonnie, who's like a mom figure. Was it hard to leave your family and, and move out on your own, or do you love it? It, it, was, it, was, really hard. it was really hard, but now I love it. <laughs> I, do, I do miss my parents every so often. But they come and visit, right? <laughs> that they do. <laughs> That's so awesome. Um, you know, we're, we're just trying to get the word out because we want people to be more educated about anybody that has any kind of disabilities of any kind and you're really proof that it this all works you just have to get out there and do it that, that's true that's entirely true right all you gotta do, all you gotta do is just take that first step uh, fake that first step and then you can do anything you want the mindset is changing and thank goodness and not a moment too soon because every person whose life has been um, segregated and diminished because the community or even the family didn't understand that human potential is unlimited and not affected by disability, but people are differently able. Um, so there is a greater uh, uh, understanding of that, I think, in the local communities, not nearly enough. We still don't see nearly enough uh, local employers who are willing to look at, at how to capture the gifts of a person, even if their uh, ways of getting things done are, are slightly different. We still see too many buildings that are not even wheelchair accessible. We still see housing that is either not accessible or so far beyond uh, the economics of, of people living with disabilities. We still see public transportation that doesn't meet people's needs. So we have a long ways to go, but fortunately I can say that I think that era where people with disabilities themselves were devalued uh, and their lives were not considered valuable and they were treated with, uh, with no dignity, I think those days are receding into the past. When you've met one person with autism, 
you've met one person with autism. Right. There's really no stereotypes. Okay. Um, and what we found is some people are gifted in, in the arts, mm -hmm. some people are gifted with math, some people are gifted uh, in statistics, some people are, are physically very capable and, and athletic. And so when you think about all the kinds of jobs there are in the world, there is a, a job that every single person can not just do, but, but succeed in. So what we're about is trying to uh, communicate this to employers. Employers are struggling with uh, finding good quality employees. You know, as the baby boomers retire, I, I learned that LA County is expecting a massive loss of their base uh, core employees over the next 10 years. So why wouldn't we look for ways that critical jobs could be filled by people with disabilities and how we can find the right kinds of supports and structures so that they can be very successful. So that's really what it's about right now is, is finding, communicating with the employer community that everybody has capability and gifts and that if we're creative and innovative, we can find good matches for employees and employers. The Gott family knew that eventually Danny would need a job, so they created Danny's Farm. And that's not the only job that Danny has now. Well, so I've actually got a few jobs, so which one do you want me to talk about? All of them. Well, my first, well I've got one voluntary job at Steve's Pets. My job there is the muscle. So if anyone needs, some, so if anyone needs like something really heavy carried out, I'll just carry it out for them. My second job is at Dodger Stadium itself. I worked a I worked at Jumbotron, but I'm still kind of in the learning process. Danny's Farm, well, recent, well, early, well, a while ago, it's just, all I was doing was just being jan the janitor, cleaning up poop and other things. Okay. But now I just got a promotion. I'm in the marketing department. Nice. So, what kind of things are you doing in the marketing department? Well, promo well, promotion, just, just well, promotion, just approaching near anyone I can, and then just giving them, just giving them, well, just giving them brochures like I did with you earlier. California. We're, we're just so blessed that California has a, uh, a law called the Lanterman Developmental Disabilities Act, which requires uh, that there be an outreach uh, effort throughout the state to identify people with developmental disabilities, inform them that there are services and supports available, and then even develop those services and supports. So typically, if, uh, if a young family um, uh, usually will learn from their pediatrician, uh, or maybe from uh, ch uh, child care provider right. that there seems to be you know some issues that require some uh, looking into mm -hmm. um, they can find their local regional center the regional center is uh, the agency that the state has identified to be the uh, the, the clearinghouse and the and the one-stop information and, and referral source for all uh, from families that are at risk of parenting a child with a disability uh, all the way through the entire life, uh, the regional centers are that, are that clearinghouse of information and re resource and referral. Los Angeles County has seven regional centers, so wherever you live, um, you're not too far from one. They have counselors, they have resource development people, they have pediatrician, doctors, um, and so we, we want to make sure that if there's any families out there uh, listening and, and wondering what, what's going on, uh, wherever they live, they're not far from a uh, regional center, and that's where they should look for the, for the start. Um, California has moved away from providing services through institutional care. Okay. Thank goodness. Right. That used to be the model that, that people felt was the only way that people, that people with severe disabilities could survive would be in essentially hospital settings. Um, over the last 50 years, uh, California has wound down its use of institutions and instead uh, implemented a, uh, a network of small community organizations that provide residential care, that provide therapies, that provide job training, that provide even recreation and camp and, and all, all sorts of um, services and supports that enable a child through an adult to go through the same experiences that, that we want all of our children and, and adult even in adult children and family members to go through. And those are principally funded through the state, through the regional center system. In some ways, we've made this more difficult than we should have. You know, okay, so I have two kids who are now adults. How did they find jobs? Uh, it wasn't by going to some, 
to a professional uh, recruiter or job placement service. It's really who you know and what your networks are all about. Mm -hmm. Most of us actually have found jobs through those personal networks. So the biggest problem is this lack of uh, relationships that lead to employment. Mm -hmm. But every family who has a child with a disability, typically they have networks, typically they're employed. Many are in uh, leadership positions in businesses and uh, in their uh, uh, communities of faith and wherever their lives are, they have the same networks that everybody else has. What we haven't done is essentially made everybody a job developer, brought in everybody to be uh, the, uh, the, the, the association developers for people with disabilities. There are jobs that everybody knows about. If you go to a dry cleaners regularly and they know you and you're one of their best customers, why wouldn't you say, hey, um, I noticed, you know, sometimes it's backed up in here. Have you ever thought about bringing somebody on that could help with, you know, some of the basic uh, duties here? I know people with developmental disabilities that are looking for jobs right now. If we had every family member and every friend uh, out there looking for opportunities and advocating, I think we could turn around um, this horrible unemployment rate of in excess of 75%. That's not an employment rate, that's an unemployment rate of over 75% people wow. with disabilities. That doesn't need to be the case. Right. If we were all looking for jobs and all ready to advocate and you know do what we would do for, for our friends, um, I think we could turn that around. And we have so many examples of people not just being the minimum producers, but when you have a person with a, with a disability in the right job, right. the right job, the right match, then that dis whatever the disability portion of their personality is or physical makeup is irrelevant because the job doesn't require that. Right. What it does require is what they're good at. And so you find superior performers, you find people getting raises, you find people uh, creatively uh, contributing to employers in every walk of life. So it's a matter of making the right match. And for more information on Danny's Farm, you can go to dannysfarm.org. A very special thank you to all of my guests, and thank you for watching. I'm Maria Soreo, and we'll see you around the peninsula.